Hello again, and welcome to Advanced Physics for High School Students. This is Lesson 85, and it is entitled, The Doppler Effect, Decibels, and Speed Along a String. This lesson addresses three topics, only one of which will likely appear on the AP Physics B exam, and so we'll focus our attention on that one topic, the Doppler Effect. The Doppler effect refers to the change in frequency of a wave perceived by an observer when there is relative motion between the source of the wave and the observer. This effect occurs for all types of waves, whether mechanical or electromagnetic. You're probably most familiar with the effect from sound waves, as illustrated by this short video clip of a passing fire engine with its siren blaring. As the vehicle approaches, the pitch of the siren sounds higher than when the vehicle is standing still. As the vehicle recedes, the pitch of the siren sounds lower than if the vehicle were standing still. Perhaps you've heard a similar effect when a train blares its horn as it passes you at a crossing. The pitch, or the frequency of the sound, drops after the sound source has passed you by. There's an applet here called the Doppler effect that graphically illustrates what's going on. In a moment, we'll get down to the mathematics of the effect. I'll read the script that's below the gray box. Here you can visualize the Doppler effect. It's easy. Just click anywhere within the gray area and drag the mouse. An arrow representing the source velocity vector will appear. The speed of the source divided by the, sp the sound speed, which equals the Mach number, is also displayed numerically. Let go of the mouse and your source will move across the screen emitting waves. Press the S key and the animation stops. Press it again and it continues. So let's suppose we have an object. I'll call it a source that's vibrating, giving off waves. Maybe they're sound waves. Maybe they're light waves. Maybe they're mechanical waves, like an object that's on the surface of the water. If the source is not moving, then the waves travel outward from the object at equal speeds in all directions, and the ripples are evenly spaced. So, no matter what direction an observer sits relative to the source of the waves, the observer receives the same frequency. But now, let the source move, and look what happens. The source still vibrates with its same original frequency. Let's let the source move at a speed that's slower than the speed of the waves in the medium. The frequency that the observer hears depends on where the observer receives the waves. If the source is approaching the observer, then the source catches up to the wave fronts that it produced in previous instance of time, and so the wave fronts are more closely spaced, and the observer hears a higher frequency than the source emits when the observer hears a higher pitch. On the other hand, if the observer is behind the moving source, then the wave fronts are more distantly spaced and the observer receives a lower frequency or a lower pitch of sound. Here's a still image of this same applet that we just saw. If I'm an observer and I'm standing here listening to the sound, you can see me with my big ears here receiving the sound waves, the direction the source is moving is toward the observer, then this person hears a higher pitch. On the other hand, if I'm an observer that's standing on the down speed side, moving away from me, this observer hears a lower pitch, a lower frequency. In this diagram, the source is moving slower than the waves can travel in the medium of interest. But now something interesting happens if the vibrating source moves faster than the wave can travel in the material. Something interesting happens if the vibrating source moves faster than the wave can travel in the material. The source outruns the wave fronts that it produces, and a wake of piled up wave fronts emerges behind the source. You've seen this with boats on the water. Perhaps you even heard it when sonic booms are produced by supersonic aircraft traveling faster than the speed of sound. Technically, the speed of the supersonic aircraft is indicated by something called the Mach number which is the ratio of the speed of the source to the speed of sound. The faster the supersonic source moves, the smaller the wake angle is behind the source. 
Here's a screenshot of an object that is moving faster than the wave can move in the material. In this diagram, it turns out that the Mach number is 1.53. And you can see in this diagram the wake of the waves, the envelope of those waves proceeding behind the source as the source moves. It turns out that there's an angle that can be measured, and we're not going to bother to do that, but that angle there, which I'm calling alpha, tells you something about the ratio of the speed of the source to the speed of the waves. But that's not something you'll be asked on the AP exam. That angle alpha would become more and more acute the faster and faster the object goes. Just as an aside, don't confuse the words supersonic, ultrasonic, infrasonic, and subsonic. They each have unique meanings. Supersonic refers to an object, an aircraft or a bullet fired from a gun usually, that's moving faster than the speed of sound. Ultrasonic deals with frequencies that are higher than what humans can hear, which is about 20 kilohertz. Infrasonic deals with frequencies that are lower than humans can hear, so these are frequencies lower than about 20 hertz. Subsonic can have two meanings, either slower than the speed of sound, or too weak to be detected by human hearing because the wave's intensity is too low. Now, let's proceed on to the mathematics. I'll present the equations a little differently than your authors do, and then we'll work some examples. Note that we're not deriving these equations. I'm just giving them to you, and then you're going to use them. I've never seen a question on past AP Physics B exams where a quantitative derivation of the equation is required. Most of the AP questions that have appeared on past exams have been qualitative in nature. So in appreciation of the diagrams illustrating the moving sources, the observers, and the waves is important, as we've seen earlier in the lesson. First, let's sketch a diagram and label some variables. Let's suppose I have a source. Maybe it's a police car with a siren blaring that's moving along the road with a speed that I'll call Vs for the speed of the source. This source is emitting sound waves, and since this source is moving to the right, the sound waves that are to the right are going to be compressed compared to if the source were sitting still, and the sound waves that are to the left are going to be elongated because the source is moving away from those wave fronts. The speed of the sound in the material we'll call V, the speed of the wave in air, the speed of sound in air in this. And for most problems, that number is going to be between 340 and 345 meters per second for sound in air. If the police car were sitting still, it produces a certain frequency, which we'll call F, the frequency of the source. And this would be the same frequency that someone riding along with the source would hear when they're moving along with the car itself. Now, let's have an observer, which we'll say is going to be indicated with a subscript O. This observer might be standing still, or the observer might be moving. If I'm standing by the road, then I'm not going to be moving. But the sound I'm going to hear is going to be different than the sound that's being produced by the police car. First of all, let's say that my speed, V sub O, is given the, the speed of the observer, and the frequency that I hear, F prime, is the observed frequency. Now notice that the observer could be on either side of the police car, either as the police car approaches, or if the observer is standing over here behind the police car, then in this case, the police car is receding away from the observer. And it turns out that it's important that we know whether I have an approaching case or a receding case. Let's take the approaching case first. If the source is approaching the observer, or the observer is approaching the source, or they're moving in such a way that the distance between them is decreasing, then F prime, the frequency that the observer perceives, is equal to F times the quantity V plus V observer divided by V minus V source. Now for the receding case. If the source and the observer are getting farther and farther apart, no matter who's doing the moving, then F prime is equal to F times the quantity V minus VO divided by V plus VS. Now I'm going to write this, these two equations, in a combined form. Here's what it looks like. F prime is equal to F times the quantity V plus or minus VO divided by V minus or plus VS. We would use the upper signs to give us the approaching case, so we would have one equation for approaching, 
or we would use the lower signs if we have the receding case, and that produces the second equation. In these problems, we look only at the magnitudes of the speeds and not their signs or their directions. The plus and minus signs in the numerator and the denominator take care of the directions for us, depending on approaching or receding. This important note is a difference between the author's version of the equations and the version that you see written here. In astronomy, the Doppler shift is referred to sometimes as the red shift, or less commonly you'll hear blue shift. And it's the Doppler effect to which astronomers point to buttress their argument for an expanding universe. Starlight is made of light waves, and the light from stars and galaxies that are known to be far from Earth possess a greater red shift than those that are closer to the Earth. How do we know whether the stars are close or whether they're far? That's a subject of an astronomy course. Edwin Hubble, an influential American astronomer working in the early 20th century, and after whom the Hubble Space Telescope is named, conjectured that since many astronomical objects produce light that is shifted toward the red part of the visible spectrum, which means that they are showing lower than expected frequencies, then those objects that are producing that light must be moving away from Earth, and the way they're moving away is explained by the Doppler effect. If these objects are moving away from us, then the universe, it's thought, must be expanding. Following that logic to its conclusion, there must have been a time in the distant past when all the universe was concentrated at a single point, and that time, so the argument goes, is the moment of the Big Bang when the universe as we now know it began. That's the modern creation myth, anyway, according to science, and there are numerical calculations that folks make about when that moment must have happened in the past. If you take an astronomy course, I feel confident your instructor will fill in some of the details.